Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name is B, and I'm an alcoholic. And if my God were to appear to me right now, and I don't know why she doesn't, I think that, um, and if she were to say to me, where would you prefer to be on this Sunday morning, I would say just right here, because my belief is that God is so tired of being in church with those people who think they're holy, and... (laughs) Don't let that get on the tape or I'll be excommunicated. And that my God is in a place like this. Oh, I'm so convinced that God is here. Before I get into my favorite topic, as Peggy Martin says, which is me, I uh, I want to thank you for inviting me here. I think you have been on my calendar for about a year. And I kept thinking, well, now, my goodness, uh, what could be happening in Omaha? And when I saw this, uh, what was it, corn huskers or whatever you call yourselves, and I'm thinking... We'll probably be out in a big field with a tent. And, uh, you know, I, I just didn't know. Well, I never know what to expect as I go across this country and into other countries most weekends. I, I just never know what it's going to be like. And uh, I've been excited about coming here, and I've been certainly looking forward to it. I'm also grateful to the three wonderful young ladies who met me at the airport yesterday and got me here safely. I want to thank especially the people who have found me when I was lost and then I was found again in this huge building. Uh, Especially I want to thank a little girl called Amanda who got me to the pool yesterday and her friend. Uh, I I met her on the elevator and I said, do you know where the pool is, honey? And she said, yes, I'll take you. You know, I'm lost, basically, you know, in life. And um, (laughs) I become lost and orphaned and and separate real, real easily. And then as I was coming in here this morning, I met two lovely young men coming here, and I said to them, are you going to where the speaker is? And they said, yes. And so I said, well, you walk ahead of me, and I will follow you, because I know I'm going to get lost again. And then one of them said to me, do you want to be in the smoker section or the non-smoking section? (laughs) And uh, I said, I think I have to take it all. (laughs) I'm, I'm delighted also to meet some people that I haven't seen in a long time. I met uh, Terry D. from San Jose, whom I met like three years ago there. He invited me to speak in San Jose. And I especially am delighted, and I'm very emotional about this. Some of my favorite people are here today. Uh, there's a group of people, I think they're sitting over here from Moorhead, Minnesota, with uh, Don M. And I especially want to ma- welcome them. They have... Um, They have driven eight or nine hours to get here, and I know they only came here to see me, I mean. (laughs) Incidentally, there were other speakers too, but however. um, God help us. Um, Some of us never get that well. But all in all, I'm really delighted to be here. I've had a wonderful morning. I, I also want to thank the people who agreed not to splash me when I was swimming this morning so that I would have, wouldn't have to wash my hair again. And that's always a benefit because um, I, I hate to have to do that before I speak. I must tell you that these spotlights uh, are making me very conscious of the fact that I have lots of freckles, and I hope that you can't see them, especially the people who are watching on the video or on their TVs in their bedrooms. Uh, Last night I was too tired to uh, come to listen to the bagpipes, and um, I went to bed, but I saw it on the TV, which was wonderful, and then I heard the speaker, so I didn't miss anything. I'm really happy to be here. What I came here to tell you, however, was that um, I'm glad to be standing up, too, as uh, (laughs) my friend here says. Uh, My last speaking engagement was two weeks ago. It was in a little place called Modesto, Northern California. I was getting off the airplane, uh, which was a commuter airplane from San Jose to Modesto, and I slipped off the bottom step, and I twisted my ankle very badly and and pulled all the ligaments. And so they had to wheel me to the terminal, and uh, the gentleman who was meeting me and had never seen me before saw me falling off the airplane. And, uh, (laughs) and, 
and he's coming to speak、uh, to pick up the speaker. And、uh, he said to his wife,、uh, "There's a lady who has flunked charm school." <laughs> And so、um, they got me to the emergency, at which place I spent three and a half hours. You know, sometimes people don't know who I am. Did that ever? You know, I mean, they just don't pay any attention. And they kept me waiting there. And then they ended up putting me in a cast and crutches. And so I couldn't stand on that foot, and I had to give my talk、uh, from the bar stool. And we had a banquet dinner prior to the talk, and I, I passed around the word that I wouldn't be able to stand. And of course, being true alcoholics there in Northern California. They arrived with five bar stools, and so I had to pick the one that I'd want to sit on. And so I'm really grateful to be standing. It really is a wonderful gift to have my feet back again, and also to be standing in a place where the crack is not. Usually in these places, there's a crack where my heels go. Well, after all that drivel, let me tell you that everything in my life was wonderful until I was two. There it was. Lots of things happened, yeah. Then and after that, I don't know why those two years seemed like they were all okay for me. And before I get into this story, which is kind of long and windy, I hope you're comfortable in those chairs because I don't have to be any place till four o'clock today. <laughs> so my my recommendation is that you will relax and take it easy and don't struggle.、Um, because、uh, my drunkalog is the most boring story I have ever heard. Truly. There's nothing. I don't. I wouldn't have any idea why Dick Martin would have picked up the phone a year ago and asked me to come here. I really have no idea, except that I know one thing, and that is that the ripple of the program keeps on rippling, and it certainly doesn't have to be through me. Somehow, there's one thing that I know now. I know very little, really, but the one thing I know is that my father is always at work, and that's why I come to you, real transparent. Real clear, real unnervous. Just show up, like my sponsor says. Be all you have to do is show up. And I know that God already has worked tremendously this weekend, through you with one another, through you with me, and God will continue to work. So it has nothing to do with me being here at all. It just happens to be the energy and the love that gets something like this together. You can all sit there and listen. It's just an amazing. It's an amazing phenomenon how this whole thing works. But anything, anyway,、um, when I became two, my little sister was born, and again, they didn't ask my permission. Life never asks my permission for anything to speak of. They they just do things without my permission. My parents kept on having babies without consulting with me. <laughs> and every time they had a new baby in that family, it just seemed that. I kept being pushed out farther from the place I knew I belonged, and that was the center. And if you ever wanted to read more about me, you might want to open page 62 of the Big Book, because it talks about selfishness and self-centeredness. That we think is the root of our problem, even though we don't think that. We really don't think that that's our problem. We think, for some reason, it has something to do with them. But my problem is me. That I know today. And I became very encased in this bondage of self from a very young age. There's a story in our big book called、uh, bond, "Freedom from Bondage" on page 544, and the author of that story talks about the causes and conditions that led us to this day. And so, when I talk about my early childhood, I believe that they're some of the factors and some of the bits and pieces that got me to where I am now. And so they went on having these babies, and by the time、uh, I became eight years of age, there were five of us, and I was the oldest. And when I was eight, a tragic thing happened in our family. My daddy went to work one day, and he never did come home. He was killed in an accident, and it was a real traumatic experience for the whole family. Now, none of that I knew then. For a long, long time afterwards, I didn't know anything about what that meant inside of me. But all I know was that my mom took me aside on the day of my daddy's funeral, and she said, "B, I want you to help me to raise these children." And I put away my dolls and my playthings, and I started about the business of growing up. And I'm really sorry to tell you that I haven't done so yet. <laughs> It's been slow. 
this business I don't think is going to happen for me. It just gets a little bit better the longer I stay around people like you. And um, I put away all my stuff and I just started to get, you know, to get really serious. And I never did any more childhood after I was eight. And my mom was a school teacher. And she was a very efficient person. And she taught me how to clean and cook and babysit. And she even taught me how to do some things in education. When I was real young, she taught me how to work with little reading groups. And she just was real efficient. As a matter of fact, I believe today that my mom taught me what it says in the book, although she didn't know that. She taught me how to become a victim of the delusion that I could wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if only I would manage well. And so I trained myself with her help to be able to manage well. And when I got into my teenage years, I did what most of us do then. I started to think about what I was going to do later. And my decision was rather spectacular, as is everything in my life and grandiose. And what I decided to do was to become a saint. <laughs> and this young man gets up here and he reads, you know, out of the big book, We Are Not Saints. I never can understand that. And in trying to become a saint, the only way I knew to do that then, and that's a long time ago, was to become a Catholic nun. Now, I always like to pause at a time like this, just in case some of you want to run away. <laughs> because there's usually a couple of people in a large audience like this who has resentment against somebody like me. <laughs> I need to let you know immediately that I didn't do it to you. Okay. And that gets me off the hook almost immediately. Because when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I took the responsibility of the entire Catholic Church on my shoulders, you know, all the bad stuff the popes did, the priests did, the nuns did, and I, but I found out a big secret since I got sober, <laughs> and that is that there are assholes every place. <laughs> was that there are some Methodist assholes and Baptist assholes and <laughs> Lutheran assholes and met a couple of Jewish assholes here and there. Um, now, this is strictly for Southern California. I've met a couple of uh, assholes in Alcoholics Anonymous, too. <laughs> I know is that human beings are human beings, and um, anyway, I started into this business of becoming a nun. Now, I want to let you know that that's a long time ago. In fact, if that was 40 years ago on the 16th of July of this year, and so that's a long time ago doing this stuff. I facetiously, <laughs> I facetiously said that when I was talking a few weeks ago somewhere, I forget, and I said, any of you in this audience who wants to know anything about celibacy, see me after the meeting. There was a long line, you know, there. <laughs> I, not that kind. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> some of you got that. Good. <laughs> anyway, I started into this nunny business way back in 1950, and uh, I worked hard at it. I um, I liked it. I still love it. I still love doing this lifestyle. It's wonderful. And some of you'll be wondering, where did I get my booze, and how did I do it, and what happened, and, and all of that. And everything seemed wonderful for a long time. Except in my case that there was something that would happen in my head regularly. And I know that none of you will identify with this. But what happened in my head on a regular basis was that a voice would go off in my head. And the voice would say, if only they would shape up, I would feel better. And that meant anybody. It meant like usually authority figures. Usually people that I, you know, that had control over me, or I thought they had. If only I could get something around me to change, I would feel better. When my superiors had sent me over to England to continue my education, and I graduated with a lot of honors from the University of London and felt very delighted with myself, at that time I used to know a lot of things. And I knew about primary education, secondary education, and college education, and all kinds of different facets of how to run the human race generally. And um, still know lots about that if I take over the show again. 
But anyway, I was assigned to teach in a little school, a public school in the northeast corner of England, and um, that voice started to get louder and louder and louder, and I, I loved to teach children, and I never knew why the voice would go off, but it would. And one day I came home from school, and this uh, notice was on our bulletin board. And the, the notice said, would any of you like to volunteer to go to Southern California? Well, I knew I belonged in Hollywood anyway. You know, I, I knew that that was part of what I had missed out on. So I signed up, and I got picked to go with a few other people. And so I arrived in Southern California on the 16th of August, 1964. And uh, in those years, we were wearing all those nunny clothes. Have you ever seen people like us, you know, with all the black serge and the white all over our heads? You could see nothing but, but, our, but our two hands and our, our faces. And uh, in fact, you might have even seen pictures of people like me on Blue Nun Wine, you know, the, on, the, on the picture. <laughs> That's terrible stuff, incidentally. I never cared for, cared for it, but it was always helped. And so, um, anyway, these nutty bunnies that I worked with and ran around with uh, were told that I was going to be their boss, that I was in charge of them. Now, I don't know how they felt about that, but I felt real good about that. <laughs> because uh, I figured out that if you, could, if you could be in a position, you know, where you could control people and tell them what to do, that's all you really needed. And so uh, they put me in charge of the school. I was the principal of the school, and I was the mother superior of the nunny bunnies, and I was going to whip Southern California in a general way into shape. And then eventually I would spill over to Northern California and to the other surrounding states there on the West Coast. And so I got there, and everything seemed to be fine for about five days. And um, <laughs> after after five days, I was to meet a man who was to be my arch enemy for many years, in fact, until about the day before yesterday. And uh, <laughs> he was known as the pastor. And for some reason, he thought he was in charge. Can you believe that? I mean, he really did. He thought he was the boss. <laughs> and I knew I was. And immediately, we locked horns to kill each other. And I planned his demise in my mind many, many times. And uh, this this voice would go off again. If only I could get him to be different, uh, then I would feel better. And that happened in many, in many ways. And I just kept thinking, you know, if I change things. And he did weird things. Like, for example, he had built this new school that I was going to be the principal of. And he, he had painted the doors orange. Now, I come from the northern part of Ireland. I don't know if any of you know your history, but that's a no-no. And, uh, <laughs> and so here I was in this school with all these nanny bunnies and all these kids and this hot weather and the Santa Ana wind and new books and new system of education. And Oh, man, I thought, gee, how am I going to do this? <laughs> I found out a way. And what happened to me was that the lady came to my office door one day. We were having this windy time, very hot, and the kids, their eyes were all watering from the smog and the wind. And, and this lady came to my door and she said, Sister, would you like to have all the sisters come over and swim at our swimming pool this evening? And I said, that sounds like a great idea. So we packed all the nanny bunnies into the station wagon. All nuns at station wagons in those days, for those of you who might remember. And we all went over there, and we got into our swim clothes, and we got we started to swim. We had a great time. And then she came to the side of the pool with a tray and a large pitcher and some glasses. And on the top of the glasses, there was salt. <laughs> Smart people in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> I mean that. I mean that because uh, I tell that story in England, and it goes, nee. <laughs> I was listening to Dick Martin this morning from my room, and he was talking about the traditions. He was saying there was what he was saying was his personal opinion. You know, what we say from the podium is what we believe in person. My personal opinion is that if you haven't had margaritas, you're not ready to be here yet. Now that's his personal. <laughs> Nothing to do with anything. But uh, I took a few. I was going almost said sips. I didn't know how to sip at all. I gulped. I was a real gulper, and I took a few gulps of this wonderful beverage. And I knew that I must have died and that I went to heaven. <laughs> and as my friend Father Terry says, well, who'd ever want to go to work? You know, where, where have I been all this time? What, what happened? You know, it's a wonderful thing happened to me. And when you look back and think about your first drink, your first whatever, your first drug, whatever you did, you think, 
why would we ever want to be doing anything different from that? And if you're new or fairly new, you might think, this is weird, you know, that this is kind of what it means. What? It, it's what makes the world go round. It makes us tick. It's the glue that starts putting us back together again, as far as I'm concerned. And I knew that I had to get this stuff, and I knew then what my problem was. I knew I was overworked, overstressed, overpressured. It gave me too much work to do. And I was one of these people. You meet all kinds of different people in the program. You meet people who are very laissez-faire, sort of laid-back people. I don't meet many of those, but I've met a few. But most of us are driven people, from what I can understand. I was a driver. I would say to the sisters on a Friday, when everybody would be exhausted from a, the end of a week's work, I'd say, let's change all the classrooms today. And we put the second graders into the eighth grade classroom. We put the fourth grade into the third grade. You know, and the kids would be pushing desks and pulling stuff out and chalkboard erasers and chalk and throwing things and water and oh, paint. Oh, any of you have anything to do with education, you know what I'm talking about. And the sisters would say to me, well, why are we going to do this? I'd say, change will do us all the world good. We're good for us all. Monday we'll come back, we'll have a fresh start. There's something about change that's going to be helpful. It'll help us to grow. And I believe, then I go to the comments and say, let's move all the furniture in the living room. I was a driver, man, driven person, lots of energy. Still have lots of energy, thank God. But I hope I can focus it in a different, different way today and channel it a little differently. But anyway, uh, I was really a kind of a driven person. And this, this drink that I had sort of answered my my prayer, really. And I said to the lady before I left, um, could you give us the recipe? <laughs> and she she gave me the recipe and I brought it home and I thought if I could get the ingredients on a regular basis and whip it up for those sisters who, who really worked so hard for me that it would be a real charitable thing for the Mother Superior to do. I just thought that. Now if you're new, you'd wonder what that has to do with anything, but mostly we tell lies to ourselves. We really do. Denial is built into the fabric of our being, just like fear is. It's built into us. And when I first got sober, I heard a fellow say from the podium in Serenity Hall in Whittier, the only prayer I ever pray, he said, is, Dear God, please help me not to believe my own bullshit. <laughs> hey, that's a great prayer. I, I, great prayer. Because basically we lie. Basically we do. We, we talk about honesty, you know, we talk, tell what the people we sponsor and we hear our sponsors telling us to get honest, but what really they're telling us is to stop lying. And I really didn't know what that, the implications of that for a long, long time meant because I truly believed that that's the way it was. I truly believe sometimes that things are the way they are just because it says so in my head, which has very little to do with the reality, often. Anyway, these, um, you know, I thought if I could whip this drink up. So anyway, the pastor came over to the convent one day and he said, is there anything you need? Now, when he said that, he always said it fearfully because, uh, he, you know, I would say, yes, we want 10 new chairs for the eighth grade. We want a new television set for here. We want this and a new car, anything, you know. I thought things could fix me. And I said to him, yes, we would like to have a bottle of tequila. And he went away, and he came back in about five minutes with a bottle of tequila, and I believe, this is my personal opinion again, I believe that he got that bottle of tequila where they manufacture it, and that's in the rectory where he lived, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and so I set out to whipping up this recipe as often as I could, and he said to me a great thing. He said, you know, we're having a little get-together for the priests and some of our friends in the area on Sunday. And we're having a barbecue and a glass of wine or so. <laughs> and um, he said, would you girls like to come over? Now, this will not mean anything to anybody hardly here, but there might be one person that will identify. In those years, there was something happening in the Catholic Church. No big deal. It was called, it was called Vatican II. <laughs> Some of you heard of it besides me. Well, you probably heard more about it than I did. But anyway, what happened was that this... This little roly-poly pope, his name was Pope John the Twenty-Third, and one day he went to the Vatican, <laughs> into the Vatican, and he found it to be very stuffy. This is my interpretation of Vatican too. And he said, "Let's open all these windows and let some fresh air get in, and let you people who are the people who run the church get a little bit more human and go out among the people and don't be so concentrating on externals and on on the letter of the law. Try to find out what's the spirit of the law and what's in your hearts." and get, you know, mix with the people and talk to them, and don't be so caught up in all those uh, things that don't make any sense. Now, what I thought Pope John the Twenty-Third meant was that we could drink. <laughs> I did. 
And so we would get invited to these little get-togethers, and I would join up committees, and I would extend my ministry to other kinds of things. And I knew at the end of every committee there would always be a drink, sometime in the year at least. And so, you know, my drinking career started in a very kind of an innocent way. And uh, I knew enough, I knew enough not to drink on the job. I never drank on the job. I was very interested when I was hear hearing Sean talking last night. I thought it was an excellent line he had about, there's no such thing as a high bottom. Because our bottom is our bottom is our bottom. It's ultimate, you know, it's, it's, it's final for us, no matter what we did, because we died. <laughs> God bless us. And anyway, I started to drink, and one of my favorite places for drinking was Mexico. And uh, Mexico is still one of my favorite countries, although I don't uh, drink there any longer. But uh, there was this man who lived in our parish, and he had a little trailer down in Mexico, in Ensenada, in Estero Beach. And he said to me, Sister, when we're not using that, you can have it. And uh, so he gave me the keys, and he said, This is the key of the front door. This is the key of the cabana. And, Sister, this key is the key of the liquor cabinet. Help yourself. Oh, I said, Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> And you know what? I meant it. <laughs> I really meant that. Because that is music to our ears, isn't it? So we I'd pile all the nuns into the station wagon again as often as we could. Long weekends, short weekends, ha holidays, half holidays. Any any time we could get down there, we would go. And I would say to the nunny bunnies, you know what? We pretty soon more than fifty percent of Southern California would be Hispanic. So we better get down there as often as we can and learn how to speak Spanish. <laughs> See? Well, on my head. Now, most of the people in that little trailer park were either Americans or Canadians, but we would go down there thinking we were learning Spanish. Well, I did, anyway. And uh, we learned a few words here and there. And um, we would go down, you know, and God, it was just grand. And then I'd come back again having to face Monday morning, this huge hangover. Oh, terrible. And then, you know, I would think, you know, how can I... How, how will I be able to find myself in places where I get enough? One little gal, one little sister in the comments, she was my enabler. She was wonderful. And she would always look out for me. She'd say, you want another drink? And she'd say, when I would come home, are you tired? I'd say, yes. And she'd say, well, I'll fix you something. And by then, they had learned to procure for me what they knew would calm me down and settle me down. I was their boss. and they, Oh, they were just absolutely great Alanons, potentially. <laughs> and so we went on and on and on and I started to think you know I don't I don't like the way this is happening to me because I would wake up at 2 o'clock well actually I never woke up at 2 it was always like 2.12 on the digital clock and you know I, I couldn't sleep anymore and all I would want to do would be to drink and I knew that only alcoholics drank at 2.12 in the morning and I knew that only alcoholics would want to be drinking before 5 p.m. I knew these sorts of things. And I didn't. Well, I worked really hard for a lot of years not to become an alcoholic. That was really, my basic thrust was never to be an alcoholic. And what I was trying to do very hard was <laughs> what the big book tells us we can't do. The big book tells us in chapter 3 that the great obsession of every abnormal drinker is that somehow, someday, he or she will learn how to control and enjoy their drinking on that even balance. And what I found out about me was that I, when I controlled my drinking, I could never enjoy it. You know what I'm talking about? I'll only have two. I'll only have three. That's a deadly way to live. But I controlled my drinking for a lot of times. And then... I also found out that when I enjoyed my drinking, I could never control it. You know, then I was doing a, well, I was doing an Irish jig on anybody's table, <laughs> and I didn't even need bag, bagpipes to do that either. I could do whatever, or I could cry for the history of the Irish country, and oh man, depressed. And, but I didn't know what it was, I had no idea. I had no idea that I was in the grip of a progressive illness that was to do with my mind and my body and my soul. I didn't know any of that stuff. I knew the word alcoholic seemed like a real dirty word for me. But then I had this big, great idea. And this great idea was that I would, I would pray more. And I would ask God to take this terrible craving from me. The book calls it the phenomenon of craving. This desire to drink more than I needed, that, that, that made me do weird kinds of things. 
And so I decided to make a retreat in Southern Cali in Northern California for 30 days and pray and fast. And you know, I had this barter system with God. God, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you. God, you do this, I do that. Look at me, God. You know, I believed in a God, but it was like God was God and I was Mrs. God, but I was in charge. <laughs> That's the way I would describe it. And um, so anyway, I decided if I did this little thing with God and me up in, the, in Northern California, that somehow it would happen that I would wake up and I'd be able to get this thing down to a science. I'd have the right mixture so I wouldn't be waking up at 2.12 in the digital clock with such anger, such anger, that I would go down to our little chapel in the convent and I would kneel there for a minute or two and I would be so frustrated and angry that I would give God the finger. <laughs> I learned how to do that when I was teaching eighth grade. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, in this place in Northern California, uh, on the on the about the fifteenth day of that thirty day retreat, they told us we were having a break day, and that we wouldn't have to do any uh, retreat exercises that day. And so they asked me where I would like to go or do what I'd like to do, and I said, "Well, I would like to visit the Napa Valley." I thought it would become cultured when you did that. So I went to the Napa Valley with a group of people, and I went into all those little wineries where you taste the wine out of those godforsaken little glasses, you know, tiny little things like this. And anyway, I remember coming home and feeling no pain, and the next day this dreadful hangover. And I went back into the retreat again, and on day 30 I woke up, and the thing that I wanted to do more than anything else in the world was to drink. And I did not know what to do. And then... I went back and I decided, well, I'm going to just forget about drinking. <laughs> God help us. You know, we think we can do that. And I stopped drinking by myself. I just stopped drinking. And I started to shake and sweat and couldn't sleep. Went through a whole bunch of withdrawals, I guess they were called. And I went to the doctor. And I, as I usually do, I tell the doctor exactly what's wrong with me because I'm an authority on most things. And so I said to him, I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. And he looked at me and asked me what my schedule was. And he said, indeed, I think you probably are. And um, he sent me home with um, a prescription for Elevil and uh, Stelazine. And then later, I graduated into Valium and Librium. And so I had these four prescriptions, you know. Now, I had them open prescriptions, and I don't know what happened with me when I took prescription drugs, but I always felt like the music on Twilight Zone. Did you ever hear that? It goes like... <laughs> like the lights are on but there's nobody home and I didn't like the way I felt at all with the drugs I, I just felt like I wasn't touching anything you know so I have to tell you that alcohol was definitely the drug of my choice it really was and so I got rid of the prescription drugs and I decided that um I would stop drinking. I went back to Ireland then for my home visit to see my mom and my family. And um, I decided then that what I would do is that I would stop drinking on the 1st of September. You know how we make these dates. We're saying I'm going to do always to the 1st of September, like the 1st of January, or the beginning of Lent for any of you Catholics. <laughs> Except that God bless us, St. Patrick's Day comes usually in Lent too. That's a blessing. <laughs> Big blessing. St. Patrick's Day was a long day for me. Like 10 days before, 10 days after. <laughs> and I love being in the United States of America. You had holidays every single month of the year. <laughs> you know, January, you had New Year's, February, you had two presidents' birthdays, March, you celebrated St. Patrick's Day, April, it was Easter usually. May, you had Memorial Day, June was the end of the school year, July, the 4th of July, August was the end of the school year or something, uh, or at the end of the summer, and then September, you had another holiday, October, you had something else, like Halloween, and November, you had Thanksgiving, and December, you had Christmas. I mean, God, who wouldn't want to be in the United States of America? I became a citizen as soon as you'd take me, you know. It was wonderful. And so anyway... Um, I decided that I was going to stop drinking on the 1st of September when I got back to school, had all these nanny bunnies all in, in gear again. But what happened that year again, like it usually does in the September when we go back to school without any air conditioning, was that uh, the Santa Ana wind blew again. How can you stop drinking then? You can't do that. And then the time went on, and, you know, we started to get into report cards and parent-teacher conferences, and one day a cat came in and had kittens on our patio, and the kids left their sweaters lying around, and they lost their tennis shoes, and they got an F on their report card, and the phone was ringing, and the door banged, and well, anything. I mean, God, you don't need any 
the bigger the crisis, the better I felt, you know, the real crisis. I mean, I was dying for big deaths and accidents and things that would help me, give me good excuses, you know. By the time, you know, that fall of 1978, I got sober on the 2nd of December 1978, the, the, the fall of that year was just deadly for me. I didn't know what was happening to me. And it's always fascinating to me as I stand in front of a very large audience. Incidentally, by the time I get home, this audience will have doubled. You know that. I always tell them when I get home. They say, how many were there? I'll say about 8,000. I always do that. <laughs> always. You know, never do the same. The bigger, the better for me. Everything has to be a little more than it really is, and bigger, and more of. I get two of everything, and I'm sent to do the grocery shopping. Two or three. You know, I, every, so you're about 8,000 here today. I must remember that. And uh, <laughs> But in an audience this big... You know, I, I'm always fascinated by how did you ever, how did you get to, to this place today? How did you get to sobriety? If you're an Al-Anon, how did you get well? How did you get into recovery? How did you die? Do you remember where you were the day you knew you were dying? Were you in a hospital bed? Were you in jail? Were you functioning? Were you bereft of family and friends? I think Bill W. talks about it so magnificently on page 8 of the big book where he says that no words can describe the loneliness and the bitter morass that he had felt of self-pity that he had found himself in when quicksand had stretched out on all sides of him and that alcohol had become his master and he knew no longer knew how to be in charge or in control of that. It had overwhelmed him. And I was in a very quiet, peaceful, kind environment when that moment came to me. I was in a convent, the convent that I'm still living in. And I was standing in our living room, and I just happened, happened, to pick up a little booklet that's written for sisters. It's called Sisters Today. And on the very back page, there was a, an ad. And the ad said, Sister, are you concerned about your drinking? If so, please call the following number, collect. My eye happened on that, and I called the number, and it was in Massachusetts. And I talked to a lady, whom I'd never talked to before, and I told her that I was very concerned because I was changing jobs. Now, that part of the conversation was true, because I was moving from the job I had then, which was school principal, into the job I have today, which is administration in the diocese where I work. And I said, I'm very concerned because I know a lot of priests and a lot of sisters, and they are drinking. And I don't know what to do about them. And I would be their boss. And so she went on in a very patient form to tell me about literature, and tapes, and recovery programs, and she told me about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she went on, and I thought, well, maybe if I can get some of this material around me and I can read it, I can know, I'll know what to do. You know, I'll know what to do. I, there wasn't one person in my whole environment to whom I could tell that I was dying. It wasn't a person that I knew. And I know today that I could have, but I didn't think I could have. I didn't know that. And so I called this strange voice. And this strange voice said to me the most extraordinary sentence and asked me this unusual question. She said, Sister, could you tell me a little bit about your own drinking pattern? Hmm. Very smart in Massachusetts, if you're ever interested. <laughs> and she said, uh, because I can hear pain in your voice. That's always very touching to me when I think about it because the grace of this program helps us to hear the pain in one another's voices, even if we've never spoken to that person before. It helps us to see the pain in one another's eyes. And through that affinity, or fellowship, or kinship, or whatever this magic or miracle that happens to us in the program is, we get to be instruments in helping to heal one another. And this woman said she could hear the pain in my voice. And at that moment, I had the grace to start crying into the telephone. And I sobbed into that instrument in my hand, you know, 
And I said, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to ask. I was the boss of everybody. How could their boss tell them that she had a problem with drinking, couldn't sleep at night, and was nervous all the time, and was crying inside all the time, and was longing and craving and dying to drink more than anything else in the world, and at the same time was doing some real high-powered, functional sorts of things within the framework of her ministry. How can I tell that to anybody? And she said, you know, you might want to think about going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, now, I didn't want to think about going to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> but she made that suggestion to me. And she said, you might want to sit there and listen to the feelings. And so the next morning, I called Alcoholics Anonymous in a place called Whittier, which was quite a, a little journey from where I live in south, uh, Southern California in Orange County. And I don't know if any of you ever heard of Whittier, but um, Whittier was a little distant. So I, at that time, we were wearing kind of a modified habit, nunny clothes, you know. So I changed from my nunny clothes into regular clothes, and I put on a whole bunch of eye makeup. I always remember that. And I got myself down to Serenity Hall in Whittier for a 10 o'clock meeting on a Wednesday morning. And when I got in there, it was a real small room. Oh, I was petrified. It was like about this, just this area here. There was a lot of smoke, and it seemed like there were all little old men just shuffling. They were all shuffling around, you know, and I, oh, I was sitting terrified. And there was a man, and he said, he was sharing from the podium, and he said that if we had court cards, that he would, he would sign them after the meeting. And I just thought that you would have to go back out and get a court card in order to come in there, to belong to that club. And then he was the speaker, and he was sharing with us his experience, strength, and hope. And, uh, he was very interesting to me, very interesting. And he was using um, words that I used to punish the eighth graders for writing on the bathroom walls. <laughs> he was using a word that starts with shh. You know, the shh word the kids used to say. And then later on in his talk, he graduated into another word that starts with th. <laughs> Uh, the, the fuck word was kind of a bad word in our environment. You know, the, the first graders used to come to my office and they'd say, Sister, bend over. And I used to put my head down so the whisper in my ear, they'd say, Tommy in the eighth grade said the fuck word. Well, this gentleman from the podium in Serenity Hall was using the fuck word in sentences. And he was, he was even using the fuck word as various parts of speech. <laughs> He was using it as a noun, an adverb, an adjective, a preposition. <laughs> um, he was using it as a conjunction, and he, he was using it as with ed on the end and I, ing on the end. And on one occasion, he used it with the word mother before it. <laughs> And um, I said, and this is going to be my spiritual leader for the rest of my life. <laughs> and when it was all finished, he said, um, keep coming back, it works. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.